Uh, so um, Flavi is going to talk about non-smooth bifurcation and the early warning signals in forced system. Please, Flavi. Okay. Thank you, Jacopo. Can you see my, my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay. So thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, so I will just give, so this is joint work with Gabriel Fullman, who is at Imperio and uh, Tobias Yeager, who is here in Vienna. So I will begin by, um, by giving uh, a non-mathematical motivation as to why we are looking at these non-smooth bifurcations. So basically, uh, this talk derives its motivation from the notions of critical transitions, which is basically uh, an abrupt and a drastic change in a system's behavior when the parameters are changed. And uh, one issue of immediate practical interest is that of early warning signals on how we can be able to signal these transitions before they actually occur. And we are mainly interested in the slow recovery rates and the critical slowing down. These are basically um, some of the early warning signals that have been studied in this direction of, of, of uh, basically in early, the early warning signals that have been studied in, in various fields. And in particular, we take the motivation from uh, uh, early warning signals that have been studied in some some, some living systems, uh, some population dynamics. And there's this paper which talks about recovery rates reflecting distance to a tipping point in a living system. Uh, the, the, basically the definition of these recovery rates is about the rate of change, I mean the rate of recovery of an equilibrium once it is perturbed from its equilibrium point. So in particular, if we look at this experiment, I'm not going to explain it, but if you have time, you can just look at this paper. But uh, basically, if you look at a system and you, 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 you change maybe some parameters and these curves that represent the equilibrium of the system, if you perturb the system, basically it has been observed that if you are far away from the tipping point or the critical transition point, the system takes a shorter time to, to return back to its equilibrium, meaning that it has um, uh, fa fast, it recovers faster, so the recovery rates are high. However, if you're about to approach a tipping point, then the recovery rates are rather very slow. They go to zero. And uh, this is a sign for you to know that you are about to approach a tipping point. So basing on this experiment, if I go back to the slides, we would, we would like to basically uh, look at some, 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 some systems that exhibit this kind of a critical transition. And if we are able to tell by just looking at the slow recovery rates and the critical slowing down, if we are about to approach a tipping point. And of course, in mathematical theory, we basically look at the bifurcation theory. And there are some bifurcations that present some key features of a critical transition. And one bifurcation pattern that presents this behavior of a critical transition is that of, is the Sardonaut bifurcation, the classical fall bifurcation. So um, mathematically, we can introduce it. Uh, I want to introduce this standard model from mathematical biology for us to understand how the Saturnode bifurcation looks like. And uh, so this is basically um, a model from population dynamics, with, which is the, the standard early effect model represented by this ordinary differential equation, which is basically the logistic model with an early term. So the, of course, the first two terms account for the logistic growth where this R here is the intrinsic growth rate and K is the carrying capacity. And then this other term basically introduces the early threshold below which the system goes to extinction. And then we subject this to an external pressure. This is by pushing the vector field downwards. So this model here is characterized by three fixed points. It has two stable equilibrium points, one at zero and the other one at K. And then it has an unstable equilibrium here at S. 
So if we push the vector field downwards by increasing this parameter beta, what we see is that the stable and the unstable equilibrium come close to each other and then at some value of beta, they collide to give us one neutral equilibrium. And this is the saddle node bifurcation point. However, if we increase the parameter further, then the two equilibrium points just run to the other zero equilibrium which persists all throughout in the population. However, we are only interested in the region where we have the stable, these two, the stable and the unstable. And so in our case, usually we say that everything just disappears from the system, though we know that it just goes to the other zero equilibrium point. So the thing is that, as we can see, this type of bifurcation presents these features of a critical transition and now we want to study how the recovery rates basically look like. Can we be able to tell that we are approaching this type of bifurcation by looking at the, uh, the recovery rates? So here I present the bifurcation diagram, which is what I already explained above. So this is the stable branch of the equilibrium point at K, and this is the unstable branch uh, for the equilibrium for the unstable equilibrium and then this here is the, the the zero equilibrium which passes all through and this is the saddle node bifurcation point so just to mention at this point is that whenever i will be representing a stable equilibrium i will represent it with this blue color and the unstable equilibrium will be represented in red so knowing that uh, we have a saddle node bifurcation in these systems we now want to to look at the recovery rates and our mathematical interpretation of the recovery rates are the Lyapunov exponents, which is basically the logarithm, computing the logarithm of the derivatives of the equilibrium. So we look at the unstable equilibrium and the, the other stable one, which is at K. So if we compute the Lyapunov exponents, what we see is that the recovery rates slowly approach this point zero. And of course, this is our bifurcation point. Which, which indicates that actually for a system that undergoes a saddle node bifurcation, it is possible for us to predict this point by looking at the recovery rates. If they're coming close to zero, then we know that we are approaching this saddle node bifurcation point. Now, our main motivation in our work is to study this same pattern of the bifurcation and these slow recovery rates in the non-autonomous systems, which we call the first, one, the, the first systems. And at this point, we will switch to the discrete time dynamics because here it's easier to understand the dynamics in discrete time. And also these discrete time systems can be looked at as time one maps of a, of a given flow. So uh, we know that these non-autonomous systems are modeled by, by skew product systems. And if we are given a transformation row on, on on a space theta to itself. This theta can either be uh, a topological space or it can be some measure space, some probability space. So a skew product system is basically a map on a product space to itself, where this theta here is the, is the space that generates the forcing process. And then our X is the phase space. In this case, we take a compact metric space and it is a skew product system in the sense that the dynamics in this base space evolves independently, but then the dynamics in the phase space depends on the first coordinate. And the corresponding maps, uh, that, that, that the corresponding maps now in the phase space um, are, are called the fiber maps. So likewise, um, in as much as I said that we are not going to talk about, uh, we are just switching to discrete time dynamics. Also the skew product flows can be defi defined via um, a system of ordinary differential equations, which generate a flow of this form, just in the same way that you have the dynamics in the base space independently, and then we have uh, the dynamics in the first space depending on the first space. So uh, now that we know that these are our skew product systems, we want to study the bifurcation and that means that it's important for us to look at how the equilibrium points basically look like 
Now, because the equilibrium points now depend on some space, which is the base space on, then we will cease to have fixed points as they look in the autonomous case. However, because of the base space now, we have some random moving equilibrium, which we call the invariant graphs. These basically look like curves, which I will um, show with an example later on. And an invariant graph is, is just uh, some measurable function from the base space to the first space, such that this condition here is satisfied. So in order to know the stability of these invariant graphs, we can determine the stability by looking at the Lyapunov exponents, which is computed with this formula here. And so if an invariant graph has a negative Lyapunov exponent, then we know that this is an attractor. Otherwise, it is a repeller. And if the Lyapunov exponent is zero, then that is a neutral uh, invariant graph. So if we look at an example, let's take an example and see how these invariant graphs look like. So we take an example of an actan family. We know that this is characterized by three fixed points. It's also a case of bistability. However, we are only interested in the region where we have, the region above zero where we have one uh, attracting fixed point and then uh, uh, an unstable fixed point. So when we introduce the forcing, which is modeled by, via this term, in this case, our forcing is generated on the torus with an irrational rotation. So it's some quasi-periodic forcing. And then we have our bifurcation parameter. So we push um, uh, the, the graph downwards. So what we see is that if we want to see how the bifurcation happens, if we increase this parameter beta, what we see is that the graphs approach each other in a uniform way. And then at the bifurcation point, this collides to give us one uh, continuous invariant graph, which is smooth. And in that case, we say that the bifurcation is a smooth saddle bifurcation. However, we notice that this happens for a value of alpha, which is equal to 10. But when we increase this value of alpha, there could be a different scenario. So that when we increase this parameter beta, now the graphs approach each other in a non-uniform way. And then at the bifurcation, they touch on a dense set of theta values. And, and then the graphs are no longer continuous, but now there are some semi-continuous invariant graphs. This one, which remains with a negative Lyapunov exponent, and this one with a positive Lyapunov exponent. And because the graphs are not continuous anymore, we refer to this type of bifurcation as a non-smooth saddle bifurcation. So we can see that in the non-autonomous setting, the saddle bifurcation can occur in two different ways. It could be a smooth bifurcation, and it would also be a non-smooth saddle knot bifurcation. And all this depends on, the, on the, this parameter alpha. And so now that we know that the bifurcations can happen in two, diff in two different ways, then what is the impact of the Lyapunov exponents? Because this is what we are interested in to know if we can predict this type of bifurcation. So we can see that with the smooth saddle knot bifurcation, this behavior is similar to the autonomous case because we have the Lyapunov exponent. This is for the attractor and this is for the repeller. We can see them slowly going to zero. However, in the non-smooth case, we can see the Lyapunov exponents decreasing. However, when we are at the bifurcation, the Lyapunov exponents stay far away from zero. That means that, yes, in as much as we see recovery rates decreasing, still it's not possible for us to tell how far we are from the bifurcation. And this gap here between the Lyapunov exponents of the attractor and the repeller is what we call a Lyapunov gap. And basically this characterizes a non-smooth saddle knot bifurcation implying that we cannot predict it by just looking at the Lyapunov exponents. Um, and so uh, having given all, so we've given all this, this this uh, outlook on the bifurcations, but then how does this actually happen? So fortunately, there is a theorem that allows us to describe a saddle knot bifurcation in, um, 
in these non-autonomous systems. And so, and this is a theorem that provides some technical conditions under which a saddle node bifurcation can occur. So uh, the theorem, there's a theorem, which is this setting is given in a paper by Nunez and Obaya, and this was, in, was given on deterministic systems. And then there's another paper uh, by Yeager and Anna, which is given for, uh, for the case where we have both a deterministic and a random setting for a saddle node bifurcation to occur. So if we consider a parameter family with the bifurcation parameter between zero and one, the conditions that first of all we need to check is that if beta is equal to zero, we need to check that there exists two invariant graphs, one which is attracting and the other one which is repelling. So I represent the repelling invariant graph by phi minus and then the attracting by phi plus. And of course we are studying the bifurcation in a given region as I had explained earlier. However, if, the, if beta is equal to one, then we know that the bifurcation has already occurred and then everything just disappears from, from tau, from the region that we are studying the bifurcation. Then we also need to check that the fiber maps are monotone uh, in the first space. We also need to check that there is a decreasing dependence on the bifurcation parameter bit. Of course, this is to guarantee that there exists a unique critical parameter. The other condition that we need to check is that we need to check that the, the, the fiber maps are concave. And of course, this is to ensure that there exist at most two invariant graphs. Otherwise, if we have many invariant graphs, then it would be difficult to describe a saddle node bifurcation. And then the continuity properties on the fiber maps and its derivatives to be able to compute the Lyapunov exponents. Now, the theorem says that under these conditions, if they are satisfied for a given parameter family, then there exists a unique critical parameter, beta c, such that if beta is less than this critical value, then we initially have two continuous invariant graphs. However, if beta is greater than this value, then the bifurcation has occurred, then everything just disappears from the system. And if beta is equal to beta c, then the two scenarios can happen. Either we have a smooth bifurcation or a non-smooth saddle node bifurcation. So with the Ali effect model, which I introduced in the beginning because we wanted to see what happens in these population models, we did perturb that system with a quasi-periodic forcing just to visualize how the attractor and the, how the, attractor and the, the repellers look like and how the bifurcation basically looks like in this system. And what we see is that, so what we do here is that uh, initially I introduced only a one dimensional base space, but in this case, to be able to visualize the attractor and the repeller, we took a two dimensional base space. So we took the T2. And what we see is that the smooth bifurcation looks like this in this Ali model. And then the non-smooth saddle node bifurcation uh, um, looks also like this. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but the interesting thing about the non-smooth saddle node bifurcation is that this yields an object known as the strange non-chaotic attractor. But I don't want to go into the details of, this, of the strange non-chaotic attractor, but basically this is a strange non-chaotic attractor. And then here we just show how the, these graphs touch from another angle, from another viewpoint, and, and this is what we see here in this other figure. So this is how the non-smooth and the smooth bifurcation look like with the Ali model, which I introduced in the beginning. So we not only look at the, the quasi-periodic forcing, we also look at some other forcing processes and we establish, we, we try to look at the, the, the occurrence of this non-smooth saddle node bifurcation. And one thing we realize is that if we perturb the system with some random forcing, in this case, we consider the best space to be some measure space. What we see is that the bifurcation that occurs is just a non-smooth saddle node bifurcation. So we don't see a smooth saddle node bifurcation. The other forcing process which we look at is the hybrid forcing. And the hybrid forcing in our case is just a combination of the deterministic forcing together with the random forcing here. And one thing we also realize is that if we try to study the bifurcation, the bifurcation which we observe in there is also um, a non-smooth saddle node bifurcation. So we don't see a smooth saddle node bifurcation. 
Now, of course, the theorem which, is, which we provided above just gives us a general setting under which a saddle node bifurcation occurs in these non-autonomous systems. However, the existence of non-smooth force bifurcations have been observed to occur in various families of skew product systems. And uh, um, if we begin with a quasi-periodical force system, well, of course, where we, we take the, the, one, the torus with a rational rotation, so this result has been established in a paper which is written by Fuhrman. And in his paper, he establishes a large set of some C2 open sets of these parameter families, which undergo a non-smooth saddle node bifurcation. Basically, this is a set with a number of conditions that need to be checked. And he shows that this set here is characterized by some C2 estimates that can be checked for various far, far, parameter families. And in particular, this example which we look at, which is the Actan family here, uh, he shows that this family here undergoes a non-smooth saddle node bifurcation for alpha large enough, which is something that is greater than 100. From 100 and on, onwards, then you can see a non-smooth saddle node bifurcation. So now what we did is to try and, 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 and establish also the occurrence of non-smooth saddle node bifurcations in randomly four systems. And to be able to prove the result on the occurrence of non-autonomous, of these uh, non-smooth side or non-bifurcations in randomly four system, we looked at this example, which is the Actan family. And then in this case, we take our best space to be the shift space with the corresponding shift map to generate some uniformly bounded noise. However, to establish the, the results, first of all, we need to establish that we have a reference system which reference system, at least we know, undergoes a saddle node bifurcation. And in this case, we can take an autonomous system that undergoes a saddle node bifurcation. And then we add some uniformly bounded noise to, to, our, to our autonomous system. So the result which we establish is that if we have this autonomous system that undergoes a saddle node bifurcation, and then we introduce a randomly forced, I mean, we, we introduce some uniformly bounded noise onto the system. And then we assume some other technical assumptions, which I didn't include in here. Then we can be able to show that every bifurcation that occurs under some random forcing will always be non-smooth. So the same result also, this is what we saw in the numerical results here with the hybrid forcing. Of course, now in this, in the hybrid case, what we see is that our reference system will be some non-autonomous reference system, in this case, which will be an, a quasi-periodically forced system. And then because we add this random component from the result which we prove in here, it will be evident. What we show is that the bifurcation will always be non-smooth. So with the case of the random forcing and the hybrid forcing, the saddle node bifurcation that, that occurs is always non-smooth. We don't see a smooth saddle node bifurcation. However, in the quasi-periodic case, we can be able to see a smooth or a non-smooth saddle node bifurcation de depending on the parameter family. So again, when we look at the recovery rates, so because the bifurcation is non-smooth, we see a Lyapunov gap. Excuse me, Flavio, you still yeah. have two minutes in okay. putting questions. Into then I will wrap it up. So we have this Lyapunov gap, which exists between the Lyapunov exponents of the attractor and the repeller, which means we cannot detect this transition. And then this is the result that we prove about the Lyapunov gap, that the Lyapunov exponents will always stay away from zero if the bifurcation is non-smooth. So then what can we do to predict this kind of transit of the non-smooth saddle node bifurcation? We decided to compute the finite time Lyapunov exponents, and that is by looking at the maximum Lyapunov exponent, which is observed on the attractor. So we only look at the attractor and we compute the Lyapunov exponents. And then we take, of course, we take a set of initial conditions, and then we take the maximum and the minimum Lyapunov exponent, which is observed. And what we see is that in the smooth saddle node bifurcation, the maximum Lyapunov exponent actually goes close to the bifurcation. We begin to see some positive Lyapunov exponents. This is also something that we observe in the non-smooth case, in the quasi-periodic case, 
With the random case, we see the maximum coming close to zero. And with the hybrid case, we see that the behavior is just similar to the quasi-periodic case. We see some positive Lyapunov exponents, which tells us that if you compute the finite time Lyapunov exponents and you begin to see some positive exponents, that means that we are about to approach a non-smooth saddle node bifurcation. And these are the results that we prove regarding the behavior, the maximal Lyapunov exponents. However, the challenge, so I will just talk about this slide and finish. So the challenge that we observe is that uh, the time scale in which to compute the Lyapunov exponents can be a tricky issue because if you choose a smaller time, then it's possible that you can observe positive Lyapunov exponents even far away from the bifurcation point. However, if you choose the time scale to be large enough, then also it's possible that you don't see any positive Lyapunov exponents. And if we try to study how actually fast this probability of observing positive Lyapunov exponents decays to zero, we see that uh, this occurs in either an exponential or a polynomial behavior. So, but we are not so certain. So this is something that we observe numerically. However, this is now something that we are trying to study and to know how fast this happens by just looking at the pinch skew product systems to be able to know how fast the probability of observing positive exponents decays as we increase the time. Yeah, so uh, with just that, uh, these are some of the references that you can look at that most of the work that I talked about can be found in these references. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Fadi. Very, very nice.